Hello, it's Tom here. I'm on my last day in Durban before going home tomorrow. We've moved hostel to somewhere a bit quieter and a bit more relaxed. And we're just spending a bit of time reflecting on what's happened. So I just thought it'd be nice to run through the last 48 hours and give you my point of view on what's been decided and what happened in Durban. So about 48 hours ago on Friday night, it really started kicking off. Um, all these closed meetings started happening and, meet, and the ministers started realising they had very little time left. As part of civil society, I took part in a protest inside the conference centre where we kind of occupied the conference centre and chanted and used the human microphone, which is a technique where one person says something and everybody else repeats it, um, which is really powerful and allows you to share personal stories in the crowd. And we did that for two hours, completely blocking the corridors and kind of really making our voices heard and reminding negotiators and ministers there that this is our future and this is the present of people in Africa and, and in, uh, in island nations. We were saying, to, telling negotiators to stand with Africa and stand with the island nations and remember that they are playing with people's lives and livelihoods here. And I think that was really powerful and we did quite, we did quite a few things like that in the last four hours. So on Friday night, uh, ministers continued talking till three in the morning and closed negotiations that we had no say in. We could not, we could not even really stand outside. We were told to move on, um, and we got asked to leave at twelve midnight um, as well, which was really hard. As we kind of we're playing an observer role, we're trying to hold them to account. And if we're not even allowed on the premises, how can we do that? Um, so we came back on Saturday morning, which was unplanned. The conference was meant to start on, stop on Friday night. Normally, it stops in the early hours of Friday morning, but. This is the first time it's gone on a whole proper extra day. Um, and we were there, we had, weren't really sure what we could do. We, there was a new draft text that looked a bit crap. Like there was a, 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 a fake text went around that, like, that was signed by nations. It, it sounds like it was a complete hoax. It was, it, that was really difficult. That was a really hard one and people were responding to that. Uh, and only the last moment before people started doing serious work on it did it get found out that it was fake. Um, and so it, on about 2.30 p.m. on our final, on this, on this Saturday, uh, we weren't sure, like, things were going on, these closed meetings continued. Uh, plenary was meant to start sometime in the morning at 10 a.m., but it didn't. Uh, so we, uh, we went into this, and so we held an emergency press briefing. We got about 30 members of the press from around the world came to see a panel of young people from Bangladesh, Norway, New Zealand, and myself from the UK talking about our views on the text that had been put forward and our views about what we thought would happen over the next few hours. Um, it was all we could do really, we could try and put our points of view across and try and outreach through the media. Um, it was pretty successful, uh, we got loads of press along but it was still kind of we're unsure what to do. At 6pm we entered the plenary hall for a, for a final sort of stock taking of what had been going on the past uh, few, a few hours. Um, so this is 6pm, it was meant to start at 10. Um, and then immediately after that, the, the actual proper plenary start, the closing plenary started, and they ran from 7 p.m. right through to about 5 a.m. 5 a.m. in the morning. So a long time. I was in the in that room the entire time. I popped out to the loo and to get water once or twice, but I stayed there and tried and tried to figure out what was going on and tried to engage with it as well. Like in that, that was really tough. Like there was at first there were obvious disagreements between countries on particular issues. So how long the Kyoto pr protocol went on for was one issue. So you, lots of countries were pushing for a shorter one so we could make room for a new treaty, a better treaty. The Kyoto Protocol only affects sort of less than 15% of emissions. Um, but So that was quite a concern. Um, and there were other concerns about the new this, this pathway to a new treaty that ultimately didn't look brilliant um, and still doesn't. Um, and that went... Uh, and th they were really strongly raised. At one point, a, a delegate from Venezuela like banged on the desk to get to talk when a decision would be, was kind of... There are, the way the, the process works, there are several committees. So there are the first two committees look at the actual d documents and they can forward it on to the five bigger committees that actually can make the decisions. Um, and they were for these documents were forwarded on without uh, it being officially approved. The chair took the decision to pass it on without getting consensus from the... From the from countries, which was quite contentious, it didn't feel that democratic. So I ended up with a delegate from Venezuela banging on the desk and even standing on the desk trying to get to talk. So very dramatic scenes um, and quite exciting, but ultimately still with no real consequences. Um, then we moved into these final decision-making plenaries when it was really confusing. Nations made statements and raised concerns. 
Um, and uh, and then at this final moment, the, there was a big discussion between India, who was making this big speech about equity and saying we need justice. We need. They were calling for. They don't want a legally binding. They were talking about whether to have a new treaty that comes in that was agreed in 2015 and comes into force in 2020. So, um, and India was saying that we can't have something legally binding. We need equity. We need something that only works on richer countries that can afford to pay. Um, and that was. It, it's really, really quite odd. Like the legally binding thing doesn't link that closely to their equity thing of being able to have the right to develop and the right to pull people out of poverty. Um, uh, but they all seemed to, all the ministers, the heads of ministers went into this tiny huddle in the centre of the room with like the lead US negotiator, Chris Hune, the UK Secretary of State for Climate Change, uh, this minister from India, from somebody from China, from all around the world, like heads of ministers in this tiny huddle in the centre of plenary. And it was crazy. This is this was where the decision was being made like about our future in this conversation, intense conversation, in the centre of a room, just kind of really, really informally. Uh, and, and we tried to get involved, and we tried, we all crowded round all of civil society, and it, it was really tough. And but we had no say, and we weren't engaged at all. Uh, but then when it came to a couple of hours later, actually making the decision, the president just sort of said, "So, we they had a couple of new draft texts put forward that we had no access to. We had no idea what was being talking about, what was being talked about. And they and they put these draft texts forward, and she just kind of said, "So the question is, are, will this text be adopted?" She waited two seconds, then bang. I hear no objection, this has passed. And like countries before had raised serious concerns with it and said seriously concerning things, but they'd raised no objection. They hadn't really put forward amendments to it to try and make it better. A text was passed that people seemed quite unhappy with. And for me, that was quite hard and really disempowering. We we didn't know how to engage with this. We didn't know how to try and make this better. We, we had no, no idea really what was going on at the time. So I was, I, I was really confused at that time and really found it really unpleasant, really didn't like it. But yeah, so that was how it went. Um, and I'll quickly talk about what was actually decided. If that, I think that might be quite helpful as a quick explanation. So for me, what's been decided is a lot about the process over the next couple of years. There hasn't been really serious decisions about what's going to happen and how we're going to tackle climate change. There's been decisions about how we're going to decide to tackle climate change. So, for example, we've decided to have a second Kyoto Protocol commitment period. So the Kyoto Protocol is, was and is the only legally binding agreement on for countries to reduce carbon emissions. And that's now got a second commitment period. It runs out in 2012, and now from 2013 there's going to be a new commitment period which will keep countries to holding them to account for a bit longer. It only affects the most developed nations, the ones most able to tackle it, and Russia, Canada, and Japan, as well as the United States, who were already not committed, are not committing to it at all, which means it covers even fewer countries, which is quite worrying, but I guess it's better than nothing. But the only problem is there has been no commitments submitted to it, so countries are legally bound but to an amount that we haven't decided yet, and there is no process for raising ambition if they submit crap ones, crap commitments that they want to do, um, and there's also that sort of loopholes in the system at the moment haven't been closed which is really dodgy and really hard, and we won't see any progress on that for months, if not a whole year. Um, the other thing was that was decided was about a process to creating a new treaty. Um, so now there's gonna be a new working group formed within the UN process that will see, seek to produce a new treaty, which will come into force in, 20, which will seek to come into force in 2020, but be agreed by 2015. Um, some people are quite positive about this, but personally, and I think most young people, most civil society involved in this process will agree, 2020 is far too late. It leaves a really long Kyoto Protocol commitment period or a gap between commitment periods, a gap between treaties, which means that they'll, which either situation will be really hard, as Kyoto is far from perfect, um, and a gap between treaties could leave the process under, in jeopardy as people kind of become apathetic to it. Um, the other thing was the Green Climate Fund, which is this fund. They decided they wanted to create a fund that last year that would have a billion dollars in it, um, and to attack, to mitigate and adapt to the effects of climate change in developing countries that couldn't afford to pay for it, which is great. Um, and that was decided, but they never decided well, how it was going to work or where that money was going to come from. Now they've created the fund. They've given it a governance structure. 
but they haven't figured out at all where the money's going to come from. And that's really tough. At the moment, there's a couple of small pledges by countries, but like, so no, nothing sustainable, no sustainable funding for it. And that'll be another key decision made in the next few years. The next, um, and, that was, that's a, and that's kind of disappointing. All the campaigns were on filling that fund rather than creating it. We knew it would be created. So that's something that's really an issue. So I hope you found that helpful. I'm sorry it went on so long. Um, I look forward to seeing you all in the next few days. Uh, bye.